Mary, thank you so much for your time today. I think most people who are watching will have a pretty fair idea about Are You Bogged, Mate? But for those who might have stumbled upon us or not heard of you, can you briefly tell us uh, your history and how you came to have an interest in this area? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm actually a, an ag scientist and I specialise in spray application technology and I get to travel around Australia speaking mainly to men and I've worked in the agricultural sector my whole life, grew up in it. Um, so I've spent a lot of time around men and just over three years ago in my area we lost two men to suicide in three weeks over Christmas and it really rattled the whole district as it, as these things do. But I guess when I went to one of those funerals and, and watched the men left behind who were trying to come to terms with the loss of their mate, um, it just really, I guess, rattled me in so much as I don't have any skills in this space because I'm not a counsellor and I'm not a psychologist. But I wanted to upskill myself and, and learn something about it because given what I do is travelling around um, Australia, speaking mainly to men, that I really had to, you know, I guess, question what could I do to to help someone or maybe even recognise this. So I essentially went looking for information on mental health and specifically on rural men's um, mental health. And I read a lot of information written by experts in the field and everything I read, I just – it just didn't make sense to me. And I, so I'm pretty well known for saying what I think, um, particularly in the spray drift world. <laughs> so I, I sat down and I, I simply wrote an article and essentially I just called bullshit on the experts and said there's nothing wrong with these men because everything I read was saying there's something wrong with them. Mm. And I, I don't think there is something wrong with them. I, I could see a gross lack of understanding of how these men operate or how men in general operate, I guess. And so I, I sat down, I wrote an opinion piece and I called it, Are You Bogged, Mate? And in that article, I have used that analogy of, of mental health and depression is a bit like getting bogged, that, you know, sometimes we can get ourselves through those rough patches, but sometimes we actually need someone to help us. And whether that's our friends or our family or, you know, doctors or counsellors, we need someone to help us out of that bog hole so that was the, I guess, the analogy that I used in the article. Um, and it, I guess the most important part of that analogy is that it doesn't matter how badly bogged we get, we don't set fire to the machine. We don't burn it and go, bugger it, that's too hard. So that was the, the analogy. And I, like I said, it was just an opinion piece. I never set out to do anything or start anything or make any waves, maybe upset a, a bit of the professional mental health sector, I suppose, but that was really all it was about was me just saying what I thought. And, um, yeah, then I put the article out there in the public sphere and it just went crazy and um, I went, I guess it went viral and my inbox filled up and people just, men in particular from all over Australia and all over the world, I had emails from every corner of the globe uh, from men just it just seemed to resonate with them and so then people started saying can you come and talk about this and so that's how it started I yeah never set out to do anything or start anything it just um took off by itself I guess one of the things that struck me in that original article was uh, you acknowledged the idea that when you're bogged it's really hard to get to that point where you go oh geez I'm gonna have to call for some backup here because you know that that's embarrassing on some level or or you know hard to admit your defeat in that regard uh, but I thought that was one of the points that really rang true you have to make that decision not the set fire decision right yeah and it is and you know anyone you talk to in the country who's been bogged they're pretty badly bogged and they're standing there scratching their head and they've tried every other possible way to get out um, and then finally they're like, oh, I've got to ring the neighbour. But they know that, you know, the neighbour's going to – it's going to be funny and people are going to make light of it and, and people are going to talk about it. And, you know, the next time you're at the, you know, the footy or something, all your mates will know that, oh, you got bogged. So I guess there's that little bit of shame attached to it 
or, you know, that stigma that people are going to be talking about it. Um, but I think that one of the really important things that I want people to know these days and what I'm stressing is that we all get bogged. Yeah. Everybody gets bogged um, at some stage. It just depends on the degree. Like some people get badly bogged and some people just live on a slippery road. And so there's all different degrees of it. And um, I think that's why the bogged analogy works quite well as um, that we can get bogged in, in different situations. You know, we can be in a really wet time and everything's wet and we're very likely to get bogged in a lot of places. We can be in the middle of a roaring drought and go to, to check a trough and there's a leaking pipe and we get bogged. So unexpected, we can get dry bogged, um, you know, going along a, a road and it's all fine. You go through a creek and suddenly you're bogged. So there's all different ways of getting bogged as well. One of the things that the men's shed movement and uh, Are You Bogged Mate have in common is that they have been able to identify something in particular about the way that men relate to each other, particularly when they're struggling. Uh, our theme at the moment is uh, connection, community and camaraderie. When I say those words to you, what do they mean in the in the context of your experience in this area? Look, I think it's um, that it, they just absolutely really underpin how men operate. And I guess because I've, you know, grown up and worked with men my whole life, I, I kind of understand how they operate. And I, I thought everybody else did too, but apparently they don't. Um, <laughs> So I think, um, you know, those things are really important and and that's what I really love about the men's shed is that men get together to do things and um, I'm really trying to educate society that men just do things differently to women. It's not wrong, it's just different. And, um, you know, men do things shoulder to shoulder, which is, you know, a, a key part of the, the men's shed that men get together to be men mm. together. And do man stuff. And it's one of the things that I promote strongly in my presentations is man time, that men need time alone with other men to do man stuff. And it's not that they dislike women or trying to exclude women. Women do things together as well, and that's important. But it's absolutely critical that men get time alone with other men to do man stuff. Um, and I, I really feel that we're in living in a society that that is – making that not okay. They're trying to make yeah. that not okay for men. Um, so, yeah, I really strongly promote that man time and, and men doing things together and it's just a critical part of how men operate. Um, women tend to emote together. Men do things together. And um, I've just been reading recently about um, The Way Men Heal, a book about how men heal and particularly in relation to death and loss, um, this book looks at ancient cultures and how they dealt with death and, you know, the, they said the women get together to emote and, and wail or cry, but mm. the men did things together. And um, that's one of the things that's missing in today's society, that those things that men traditionally did together when we lost somebody are now outsourced. So men used to make the casket, men used to dig the grave, um, and now at best they get to, you know, be a pallbearer to carry the coffin in and out. So men really need to do things together. Um, and some of the African tribes, they actually get together and, and the men sing about the person that they've lost. So um, it's really, yeah, the whole concept of the men's shed is, so, is, I think, just brilliant because men getting together to do things, men communicate shoulder to shoulder rather than face to face, which I think is why a lot of our mainstream support services and counselling doesn't really work for men because they take them out of their comfort zone, they put them in a room that they're not comfortable in and they stare them in the eye and ask them how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I often use the example, if you ask a, a woman how her week has been, she will tend to go to the emotions. I've been happy, I've been sad, I've been frustrated, I've been angry. If you ask a man how his week has been, he will go to the facts and men tend to talk about facts. Um, he will say, you know, the tractor broke down or the fence fell down, I had a flat tyre, um, you know, my team won the footy. So it's about the facts, and we know what the feelings are that go with that. Um, so men do communicate differently to women. It's not wrong, it's just different. The pandemic then must put a really interesting layer over the top of that, because even if I just speak from my experience as a bloke, you know, 
I got enough work at the moment. Uh, family's going well. I'm seeing my kids more than ever. All ostensibly everything's going fine, but I have that feeling like I got not enough purpose. I'm not doing enough stuff. So what you just said really spoke to me. And the sheer fact that we're having this conversation instead of being at a live event where we're interacting speaks to the fact that uh, there must be some guys feeling pretty straightjacketed at the moment, right? Yeah, and I think um, yeah, men in particular to have that downtime or that time with other people or men in, as, you know, in specifically with other men um, – and certainly the guys that I deal with in rural areas, it's not isolation. I get a lot of questions about the isolation because people in, in rural areas, they're okay with isolation. They choose that. That's where they live and they know that. What they can't cope with, I guess, in a pandemic is disconnect. And so, you know, they, they're alone on the farm or the property for weeks on end sometimes, months on end. But it's that connection that they get when they get to go somewhere, you know, to the local footy, to go to the polo cross, to the camp draft, to the cattle sales, to connect with other men. Um, social distancing, distancing isn't a big issue in the bush. We're used to it. Um, big, you know, personal There's not, not a lot of problem with blokes getting inside one and a half metres, really, is there? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, you know, the comfort zone in the bush is a bit bigger, so our personal space, so... <laughs> But simple things like not being able to shake hands was one of the biggest things last year that rural men said to me, it just feels so unnatural. You know, I miss shaking people's hands. Um, so those sorts of things, it's a, it's a way that they connect. It's a way that men connect is to shake hands. And when you take things away like that, um, you know, if they play in the local footy team or they go get together with their mates and play golf, again, that's their man time. It's their connection. So... I'd say that yeah, the, the disconnect is the problem rather than the isolation um, for rural areas. But, yeah, the whole world's turned upside down. Um, I think rural people are probably a lot better placed in this pandemic than um, people in metropolitan areas who are, you know, confined to a unit or a very small house with all the kids and dogs and everything and they can't go out. You know, that's really where rural people feel for those people in the city, that to be cooped up like that. Um at least, um, you know, we often have a bit of space to get out and do things in our yard or on the farm. But, um, yeah, the pandemic has certainly changed everything. And uh, simple things like the cattle sales and sheep sales and that where people couldn't go. Um, in the town where I live, the, they have big cattle sales there. And there's a lot of old retired farmers in that town. And that's the one way that they connect that week is, you know, they go down to the cattle sales, they get to talk to other men, they get to talk to a few agents, they get to see the condition of the stock and they know what's happening um, around the region and being, you know, have to stay at home and not allowed to go to a cattle sale was just a huge hit to their social calendar um, and the way they connect. If somebody's watching this right now, whether the pandemic's in play or just uh, any number of the other things that can go on in life and... We asked the question, are you bogged, mate? And the answer is yes. What's your message for that man right now? I guess the um, that's probably the hardest part is to say yes and to say, um, you know, yeah, I actually probably need some help. And I guess there's varying degrees of that. And I don't want people to panic and think that, oh, you know, you've got a mental illness and we need to, you know, wrap you up in cotton wool because um, – some some men just might need some time alone with another bloke just to, you know, sit on the bank of a river and fish. And there, there doesn't even have to be a conversation, um, which is one of the things I try and stress to women is that men can actually sit into the same space and share the same silence and actually heal. And they don't have to communicate. They don't actually need to use words, um, which is a concept that most women don't actually <laughs> understand. Um, you know, I often hear... Women say to their men, oh, you know, you went fishing with your mate. What did you talk about? Mm. Nothing. Not much. What do you mean? You must have <laughs> talked about something. No. Mm. And, you know, the women just need to fill that space often with with conversation, whereas men don't. Um, so I guess it's make that time for yourself. And if you, if you do need professional help, there's certainly, you know, plenty of options out there for that. Um but don't, don't immediately think that you, you know, need medication or need counselling. You might actually just need to prioritise time for yourself. It's a bit like putting that oxygen mask on 
in the plane, you know, the instruction they give you on a flight, if we're ever allowed to fly again, um, <laughs> that put your oxygen mask on first. You can't help others and you can't be there for others until you put yours on first. So um, I guess that's one of the things that men that I talk to often feel very selfish for that. They they don't want to prioritise that because they feel like I've got to work more, I've got to do this, I've got to look after my family. And yes, you do, that. that's great. But unless you look after yourself first. So maybe you need some time, some man time. Maybe you need a weekend off. Maybe you need to go to bed a bit earlier. Maybe you need to eat better. So some of those simple things that we can do um, to get ourselves into a routine and eat well and, and you know, get a little bit of exercise if we're stuck in an office or something um, and do reach out to those support services. But even if you, you know, are seeking help or, or medication and, you know, there's plenty of people who need it, but you have to hold up your side of the bucket. And I talk a lot about buckets and the crap that gets dumped in our bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw a really good quote the other day and it said, you can't save someone who doesn't want to participate in their own rescue. And I thought that really makes sense to me because I talk a lot about holding up your side of the bucket, that there are so many support services, friends, family, doctors, counsellors who want to hold up the other side of your bucket when it gets too heavy. But you must hold up your side because if you let go of your side, what whatever everyone else does is pretty much pointless. Mm. And to continue your analogy, even the best drivers get bogged at some point in their life, right? Like just because you've had a bad run, sometimes for a really good reason you've had a bad run, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean uh, that you're on a trajectory for life or worse, a trajectory for death, right? No, that's right. And I think um, – it's being able to or being self-aware enough to pull it up and go, you know what, I actually need some help here because um, after I wrote that article, I got a lot of wonderful stories and one actually came from my brother-in-law who had gone down to the creek and bogged the little four-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. So then he walked back to the house and got the tractor and went down to try and pull it out and then he bogged that. <laughs> and so then he walked home and he got the bigger tractor and he bogged that. And then he got went back and got the road train and he bogged that. So he ended up with four or five vehicles bogged because he wasn't able to pull up and go, you know what, yeah, yeah. I actually need to go and ask my wife to come and help me or the neighbour yeah. so we can exacerbate our own problem. Um, yeah, so my sister-in-law said in this photo of five vehicles bogged and she's like, and he did it all <laughs> himself, like didn't even tell me that he needed help. So, um yeah, and a, a friend on Facebook the other day, she did the same thing. She said, I bogged the four-wheel drive and then I went and got it. And she ended up with three vehicles bogged till yeah. the neighbour saw her and came over and she said, yeah. So it's being able to pull it up and go, you know what, I'm not coping right now. I need to, yeah, take a day off or, or you know, have some time to myself or, you know, have a holiday or whatever it is that you need to do. It could be just going out in the garden. It could be just getting up early and watching that sunrise, whatever it is for you. Um, and I'm a big advocate for that, that, you know, if you want to go and sit on a mountain in the Himalayas and, and meditate, do that. If you want to go and get medication, do that. Um, you know, if you want to garden, do that. If you want to go fishing, do that. So making sure that um, you pull it up before you bog half a dozen vehicles. And one of the things that I found uh, really counterintuitive in that original blog post that you wrote is um, – we might be really hesitant to ask for help, but we're never hesitant to give help. If someone reaches out to you, in, in that original blog post, you said about these blokes had so much on their plate and yet they dropped everything that they did to go to a funeral, they would have dropped everything that they did to go and help the bog bloke, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, you know, I guess when people... Um, if I'm doing an event and, you know, someone's organised it and they advertise it as a mental health thing, there's a there's a lot of blockages there. And um, earlier this year when I was in South Australia, I went to this little town. I went into the shop to buy some milk because I was going to be there for five days. I had, you know, several events around the area. And the lady at the checkout said, oh, my husband needs to hear you speak, but I can't get him to go. And I said, well, don't tell him that he needs to go tell him to come because he might learn something that will help a mate because we will all help a mate. We will all do something that will help a mate. So when we, you know, look at it that way is that we, you know, we could learn something that will help a mate. And essentially that's 
what I started, how it all started, was me looking for information that I could help somebody else. And um, when we put that spin on it, that's, uh, you know, it's it's less daunting and, and men go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll come along. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, you know, I've had fathers come and say, right, I, I wish I'd brought my three sons. Um, so that's, yeah, the help and mate concept is we'll all do that. You could almost say uh, community connection and camaraderie, could you? Absolutely, absolutely. Community is what we do best in Australia. You know, it doesn't matter what disaster strikes, uh, the community chips in. Everybody chips in to help each other. Um, and, you know, in small rural communities, if someone gets sick, everybody chips in to help. Um, there's no shortage of help and, and no shortage of people to do the, the work and to help you. Um, it's just that actually being able to get it out and say it. As I said a little bit earlier, uh, what you do and what we do as a shedding movement have kind of come at the same problem from slightly different angles, but come up with uh, exactly the same solution. And so we uh, have been really lucky to have access to your wisdom. Hopefully it'll be in person again in the future, in the not too distant future. I see you've got a, a couple of events booked for October, so fingers crossed we'll be uh, far enough down the track that uh, we'll be able to see you face to face in the not too distant future. But thank you for participating in this and uh, sharing what you've learned and uh, hopefully given a few of us permission to um, put our hand up and uh, help us get out of the mud. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think um, one of the things that's come out of this for me is the, the terminology that it's a little bit easier to say I'm bogged um, than, you know, ask for, you know, I've, I've got mental health issues or something. And I guess we all have mental health. It's how we manage it. Um, so I love the men's sheds. I've, I've spoken at men's sheds from, from Weeper down to the, the Queensland border and, and other places around the country. And I really I love speaking at, at men's sheds. The, the reaction I get there is, is wonderful. Um, and the amazing stories and the amazing history that a lot of those guys have is, oh, I just love it. Love the men's shed. Well, not all Sheilas are welcome, but... I know. <laughs> but you clearly are. Uh, thanks so much, Mary. Thank you for having me. Bye. Have, have you guys all seen the Bog Gallery on Mary's site? Yeah. That's the classic yeah. of it. On your wedding day, they say all the time, today's disaster is next year's dinner party story. You know what I mean? And that's kind of... That, that's kind of what happens when she goes sideways in your life. If you can get through it, you'll get to a point where you can laugh about it, right? But um, yeah, yeah. Which is why I love the yeah. bog gallery. It's like, just, I'm not embarrassed. Here I am screwing this up. Here I am screwing this up, you know? Yeah, um, and that's the thing that they willingly shared those things. Um, and it was because I've done so much work in the cotton industry, it actually really struck me when I got all those bog photos initially to go with the article because I just put the call out on Twitter and said, listen, I want some photos of bog machinery to go with an article. Can you yeah. give me some? And I, I pretty much know every cotton grower in Australia and I did not get one photo of a bogged cotton picker because it is the most demoralising thing that they can do is to <laughs> yeah. bog that because it is the heaviest machine that they will ever put on a paddock. Yeah, it's, about right. 38, it's about 38, 40 tonne. So when you bog a cotton picker, it's just they the just height start. of embarrassment. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I rang a bloke who I knew owned about six of them He's a big contractor and he's a mate of mine. And I said, come on, mate, you must have bogged a cotton picker. He's like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he bogged one so badly. Like he's bogged heaps of them, but he said he bogged one so badly. He got out and he just yelled at all of his blokes and said, anybody who takes a photo is fired. <laughs> That's it.